Today's episode is brought to you by Amp Robotics. Did you know that Amp Robotics is transforming the economics of recycling using advanced artificial intelligence guided robots? Yep, the company's high-speed industrial robotic system, Amp Cortex, precisely automates the identification, sorting, and processing of material streams to extract maximum value for businesses that recycle municipal solid waste, e-waste, and construction and demolition materials. And the AMP Neuron AI platform operates AMP Cortex using advanced computer vision and machine learning to continuously train itself by processing millions of material images and adapting to changes in a facility's material stream. Plus, the AMP Insights web-based data management system captures all of this material stream data, providing insights and important alerts to operators so they can optimize their recycling business even more. And I've actually seen the system in action myself, and it's awesome to say the least. So go ahead and learn more at amprobotics.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Waste 360's Nothing Wasted podcast. On every episode, we invite the most interesting people in waste, recycling, and organics to sit down with us and chat candidly about their thoughts, their work, this unique industry, and so much more. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Welcome to today's session, People's Choice Hard to Recycle Items. I'm Tony Colosimo, your moderator. I'm CEO of, Way, of Sparta Waste Services. We have three people speaking today. Walter Acorn, Alcorn, Walter Al Alcorn, sorry. <laughs> Brett Stevens and Kelly Kramer. Uh, we'll start with Walter. Uh, Walter is, uh, manages legislative and voluntary initiatives impacting electronic product recycling design, eco-labeling, packaging, hazardous materials, restrictions for uh, Consumer Technology Association he works for. Prior to the uh, CTA, he co-founded the National Center for Electronics Recycling and provided consulting support and services and electronics recycling systems for the public and private sector. He's worked for many Fortune 500 companies and the Oregon DEO. Thank you very much, Tony. Walter Alcorn, as uh, Tony mentioned, is my name. I am with the Consumer Technology Association. Just a little bit of background on them uh, before I go into the slides. We, we represent manufacturers, retailers, and others in the Consumer Technology Association, or Consumer Technology Industry. You might remember us in our old name, the Consumer Electronics Association. Um, we have uh, more than 2,200 companies as members. Most of them are small, but we also represent uh, most of the big name brands of electronics uh, and uh, technology companies. So what we did is we had the Rochester Institute of Technology, um, the Golisano, Golisano Institute for Sustainability, put together a study. Basically, if you weighed all the TVs, all the DVD players, all the smartphones, uh, all the monitors, if you weighed all those consumer electronics uh, and added it up for each year, how much material is going on to, into the market? So as you can see, there was a steep rise during the 90s, uh, but then it peaked about 2000, bounced around a little bit, and you can see some of the trends. Like for example, when uh, CRT televisions and CRT monitors went out of favor, that you know, dropped off the weight quite a bit. And then uh, when it, everything was LCD, you can see the dip in 2007. That actually was, uh, remember the LCDs back then were pretty small. Uh, if you had an LCD TV, you're generally, you know, looking at something 40, uh, 42 inches or less. Those grew. And now uh, we're into the LED era and later, but you're seeing a continuation of the decline in weights um, that are being put on the market. And this is across all the different types of uh, consumer electronics. So this really is indicative of, of a big trend. I think it has a significant impact on the waste and recycling industries. Um, and it's dematerialization. Our companies have been working quite diligently to figure out how to use less material in their products. And they're doing this for a number of reasons. One, uh, if you 
use, if you have to buy less stuff to make your products, it's cheaper. Um, you know, you want to be more efficient, not only in making your products, but also in shipping your products. You know, if things weigh less than uh, typically, unless it's really bulky, it's going to be cheaper to ship. And then there's the probably biggest part of all, which is consumer demand. So, you know, remember in the CRT era, the TV generally sat on the floor or sat on a big stand. Nowadays, you get a, a much larger screen TV and you hang it on the wall. So that's because it is much lighter because it, it has a completely different form factor um, and the technology is better. So this is, uh, again, we, this is not a short-term trend. I mentioned CES uh, here. This is actually a trend that we're continuing to see at CES. CES is where uh, manufacturers bring their products. They show them off. A lot of them are prototypes or they're maybe six to nine months away from being uh, on the market. Um, so you can get a glimpse of the near future and in many exhibits, the more speculative future, uh, what companies are trying to do. And we continue to see um, more efficient use of resources in consumer electronic products. That, that trend, I think, is going to be going for um, a significant, well, at least the foreseeable future. So this, again, just as a graphic showing, we went from leaded glass to, uh, we had a brief period where we had plasma TVs, um, which do had, some of them did have lead and arsenic in them. And then uh, we had the LCD, CCFL LCD era. That was about a decade. And those uh, used mercury in the lamps. And now, from about, well, about the last eight or nine years, we have been uh, in the LED era. So we have some newer technologies that are really starting to take off, like OLED, um, and those also, uh, at this point, uh, you know, they're, they're still emerging, they're still expensive, but that's been the history of, of our industry. New technology comes out, it's very expensive. Uh, the price come down, comes down as it goes uh, into mass production, and so we're seeing that. Uh, OLED, and then there, there are additional technologies that could take off. Quantum Dot is getting a lot of buzz, uh, but we'll see. But we're continuing to see an evolution, not just of the technology, but actually the materials that are being used within those, uh, tech or to support those technologies. So this is, this is, I guess, evidenced by a constant in our industry, which is change. Um, a lot of it is Moore's Law, as, uh, as processing power has continued to increase exponentially. It has enabled many of these technologies to be uh, commercialized uh, that didn't exist before. Um, it's driven by really a combination of that, those technology improvements and innovation. This, our industry has been fortunate to attract a lot of uh, amazing minds and innovators who try all sorts of things. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, uh, but it still, as an industry, allows us to, to be very innovative. Um, and we are also seeing a lot of new product form factors. And I mentioned the mobile revolution. And it hasn't been very long, you know, since these, you know, smartphones. We, we do so much with these now. You know, it, it's, it's been, it hasn't been that long, really just a decade or so, uh, that we started doing that. And uh, that has really changed the way that a lot of companies are thinking about products. So now, uh, as we have a breakthrough technology like uh, the smartphone, it actually affects the entire ecosystem of products uh, that are around it. Again, a lot of this is not linear. Uh, there are lots of attempts, lots of things that don't work. Sometimes they do. Um, and then, you know, people make a lot of money off of it, I guess. So we're also seeing displacement of older devices. Cameras is a good example. Um, these things are... You know, the camera in the new phones is amazing in terms of the quality and, the, and what, what you get out of that. So we just don't see the sales of, ind of separate independent cameras anymore. It's just that that market has really fallen off. Um, so convergence is another term that we use to describe that. And then we also see new technology-dependent industries. You know, if you didn't have one of these, uh, Uber and Lyft probably wouldn't exist. Um, if, you, if you had uh, one of these, uh, Airbnb is another industry that, or the beginning of an industry that, uh, that really only works when everybody has one of these. So um, it's interesting. We do see a lot of change, and I think we're going to continue to see uh, a lot of surprises. I think good things coming out of this as companies figure out how to use the technology and apply it in new ways. So what does this mean for folks that worry about these products once they're at end of life? 
Um, obviously, this is affecting recycling markets. Uh, the title of this session is hard to, hard to uh, recycle products. Yes, uh, some of these electronics, especially historically, are tough to recycle. CRT televisions, CRT monitors are drag. They have leaded glass in the tubes. And that lead is bound up in the glass like you wouldn't believe. It's very difficult to separate that out. So it's been a long-term challenge for a lot of people uh, to manage that. So, but the good news is we're seeing in the newer products less amounts of lead. Again, that's gone with CRTs uh, uh, almost completely. We also have mercury that's gone away now that the CCFL LCD era is, is over. Um, but there's also a downside. Uh, you know, that's good if you're in the waste and recycling market. We're also seeing more basically boring materials going in. We don't see the same level of precious metals uh, that we saw in the 90s, for example. Um, they've been engineered out. And so if manufacturers can figure out a way to not require the gold or the platinum in, in their devices, they generally don't do that. And so that's been a, a long-term uh, uh, design efficiency improvements. So it means for the recycling side, uh, you really have to be much more selective in terms of finding products that have those types of precious metals. And we still have um, we still have a fair amount, fair number of uh, CRTs that are that are out there. We measure that every year. We do a consumer survey. We're going to do another one this summer. But roughly a quarter of U.S. households still have at least one CRT television or monitor, um, and that's one of the things that causes the entire stream of consumer electronics to be underwater economically. So it costs more, uh, it costs more to recycle um, those electronics than it does, than, than you can certainly get on the back end in terms of, of any uh, revenue. Um, and then collection is, is a big challenge. That's, that's probably one of the toughest things uh, for our products, getting them out of people's homes and into the recycling stream. Um, because, you know, the folks, you guys know this a lot better than I, but, but uh, particularly for the larger TVs, they're not easy to ship. I mean, you, you just, you, depending on what kind, of, uh, what kind of transportation infrastructure you've got or what kind of trucks you have, um, most folks don't really have an easy way to collect those. They often require special special collections uh, or drop-off facilities. So here's some of the challenges going forward. We have a number of state laws in the U.S. specifically on consumer electronics. So we have 25, to be exact, 25 states that between the years 2004 and 2011 uh, enacted laws that require or uh, have some mandate associated with recycling electronics. So they're getting a little bit dated at this point. Um, they were really constructed in a way that uh, CRTs were the big challenge, and I think that was on everybody's mind whenever, whenever those laws were, were written. And they also assumed that there would be either most of the, not all of them, but many of the laws assume that there would be a continued increase in e-waste, as we call it, um, over time, which has not exactly happened because, remember that initial graph that I showed, the inputs and in the, in the material inputs into our industry peaked about 2000 and have really come down since then. Um, we also have, uh, we also have a, a pretty a hefty financial burden on our industry. So as somebody who works for a trade association, represents a lot of these companies, I certainly hear about it a lot in terms of how, the, how much these companies are paying. It's, it's over $100 million a year our companies are paying just to recycle uh, and associated costs associating with recycling electronics. So it is definitely uh, underwater in terms of uh, uh, the industry without this. So I, a couple of other things I want to mention, batteries. Remember I mentioned the mobile revolution? Well, with that, we get a lot of lithium ion batteries. Um, and that is changing. You know, it used to be, uh, well, there were previous battery chemistries like NICAD, you know, and that was certainly a problem in terms of uh, worried about landfilling. Um, now lithium ion batteries are, are the dominant battery chemistry. Um, we're also seeing 
non-removable batteries. That creates uh, some challenges, but it also, uh, frankly, keeps uh, consumers from pulling out the battery and putting the wrong one in. We have a lot of specialization going on in products like this that uh, if the wrong battery gets in there, there it does create fire hazards. I hear about that a lot. The big issue uh, here, and probably many people here know this, is fires. That this is basically something that uh, I've heard I know with MRFs, um, you know, when these batteries do get taken out, our products containing batteries and they get thrown into these into the recycling bin, they can create problems. Transfer stations, I know they have problems. Uh, so this is this is really more of a, I would call it more of a safety issue than a landfill, you know, exposure issue or leachate issue. So, um, and that's one of the big challenges we have because uh, these lithium ion batteries power most of our devices. So this is this is something that um, until the big brain somewhere figure out new battery chemistries, we're going to be dealing with this for a while. Um, hopefully that will happen uh, in the foreseeable future. There are a lot of people working on it, but uh, but for now this is this is definitely something we're we're all paying attention to. And then just on a policy basis. Uh, I mentioned those 25 state laws. The first state to enact a law was California, and they enacted a, uh, a an advance fee on the sale of new televisions, new monitors, new laptops. And that actually did not get repeated in any other state. After that, the, the, uh, the overall theme was extended producer responsibility. 24 states passed laws that put some or all responsibility on manufacturers to take care of the recycling of those old products once they, they got to end of life. So that is that that was pretty much done with the presumption that manufacturers, if they had to do it, be responsible for it at end of life, they would be incentivized to produce things that are more recyclable. And what we've seen is there's total disconnect. That's not been a driver, at least in our industry, because uh, showing earlier the change in the technology and Moore's law, those really have driven product design much more. And even though there have been environmental benefits, I'd love to be able to claim that our industry did all these things because it was right for the environment. That wasn't what driven. You know, it was better technology. It was materials uh, that were more efficient that really has driven this. But we're still dealing with some of these, these old laws. And I would also just note that it's been very tough for um, governments to keep up and some of these laws to keep up because, you know, we we, we, we've already seen since these laws were, we've seen smartphones emerge, we've seen tablets emerge, you know, we now have, uh, you know, Alexa. I mean, we have all sorts of things that uh, we didn't have, and some of them maybe should be part of these laws, but I don't know. We're, we're, we're sort of in the middle of this experimental phase with uh, on a policy basis, so I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Well, our next speaker is Kelly Kramer. Kelly leads the How to Recycle program within the Sustainability Packaging Coalition and is director for a program management at Blue Green. How to Recycle is a next generation recycling label for packaging organization that helps people recycle more and recycle better. Under Kelly's leadership, How to Recycle program has grown more than 40% each year and has strategically scaled its operations to successfully influence brands to change their package design to be more recyclable. Uh, with that, and by the way, you know, she's an environmental attorney and, you know, and a vol, you know, coming from Tennessee. Kelly. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today. As was mentioned, I'm Kelly, and I lead the How to Recycle program at Sustainable Packaging Coalition. So today, in this hard to recycle session, I'm going to be focusing on flexible packaging, and I'm going to share how the How to Recycle program is helping clarify the recyclability of flexible packaging. So first, I'm going to give an overview of How to Recycle for those of you who aren't as familiar with the label program, and then I'll dive more into flexible packaging after that. So How To Recycle is an on-package recycling labeling system, and it can be applied to any product, any package, any material, and any format. And the reason is because we also tell people when not to recycle something. The label has been out since 2012 and is a project of Sustainable Packaging Coalition, and we are a 501c3 nonprofit in Charlottesville, Virginia. 
So this is our label design. The way that it works is we tell the consumer what to do with every part of their package. So we don't just say, oh, recycle the paper box. If you have something like a frozen food meal, the how to recycle label tells you what to do with all components of the package. So here's an example where maybe the consumer needs to check locally to see if the plastic tray is recyclable where they live. And then there's a couple important attributes of the label. One is the special instructions tab that you see on the top of the right label there. And that's where we can give instructions to consumers to prepare the material for recycling if we need to. Another feature is we have our URL on the side of every label. So people can go online for more information if they need to. When we did consumer testing on the label before it launched, that was a really important feature because people appreciated that they could learn more online. So the way that the program works is brand owners and retailers can become members of How to Recycle. And then they can choose to label one of their packages with How to Recycle, or they can label everything in their portfolio. And so this is just um, a portion of our membership. We have over 140 brand owners and retailers in the program right now. We are in a growth phase. We grew 45% last year and similar growth the year prior. So if you look at well, what is the size of that membership, really? So I mentioned it's brand owners. And so here are just a few of our members. And you can see that collectively, they own hundreds of brands. So these companies can choose to use the How to Recycle label on a few of their brands or all of them. So um, we're currently on hundreds of brands, but we still have a lot of work to do in terms of um, further penetrating the portfolio of each member company. So I want to talk a little bit about why How to Recycle began in the first place. So we all know that recycling has issues that have been ongoing for years, but specifically when it comes to communicating recyclability to consumers, there was so much room for improvement. So there are a lot of really good materials that are still going to landfill, like aluminum cans and corrugated boxes. There's also not yet standardization in recycling and labeling. A lot of brands, they like to do their own custom messaging and say something to the consumer in their own cutesy, custom way. And so there hasn't been standardization yet across brands. And then additionally, recycling information can be really confusing. It can be confusing even for me as a professional in this space. And so there was an important driver to reduce that confusion at the consumer level um, to help people understand the right way to recycle. So these are a lot of the drivers for why How to Recycle began a few years ago, but they still are ongoing and they still are really important. But overall, we aim to be consistent and accurate with all of the recycling claims that we issue to packaging. And so there are four main recyclability categories in the How to Recycle program where we label each component with one of these four categories. So on the far left-hand side is our widely recycled label, and that applies to packaging where at least 60% of Americans or 50% of Canadians can recycle that package where they live either through curbside or drop-off recycling programs. And there's also nothing else wrong with the package. Um, that would impact the recyclability otherwise. And I'll talk a little bit about that more in a minute. And then we have our check locally label, which is uh, for packaging where fewer than 60% of Americans can recycle it where they live and they need to check locally for that item. Or it might apply to a package that otherwise has good availability to recycling programs, but there's something challenging about the package and it might not get recycled as frequently. So we need that qualifier on there from a legal perspective. And then we have our not yet recycled label. And that tells consumers to put the item in the trash because as you all know, it's just as important to tell people to keep the bad stuff out of the recycling bin as it is to get the good stuff in. So that's for packaging where fewer than 20% of Americans or Canadians can recycle that item where they live.
And then finally, we have our store drop-off label. That's for polyethylene films, bags, and wraps. And so the idea for, for this packaging category is the consumer can take those items to the grocery store and recycle them along with their plastic shoppy bags. So these items should be kept out of the curbside bin, but they are recyclable through store drop-off. So I'm going to get a lot more into detail that in a little bit later. So you may be wondering, well, how do we determine recyclability? We do a custom recyclability assessment for every package that features the How to Recycle label. So companies send us their detailed packaging specifications, and then we do an assessment taking these elements into consideration. And so the first is collection. So that's what I was getting at a minute ago when I said, how many people can recycle this item where they live? So to um, support that part of our analysis, we have uh, the Sustainable Packaging Coalition did a centralized availability of recycling study where we looked at a national level how many people can recycle different packaging types in different communities. But then we don't just stop there. It would be easy to stop there um, because we also have to think about sortation. So how is that package going to flow through a material recovery facility? Is it going to get to the right bale? Is it going to contaminate other bales? And so that's important. But then also once it gets to the reprocessing stage, is there some aspect of the packaging design that's going to cause problems in reprocessing? So is there a problematic adhesive on the label that's on the bottle, for example? And on the reprocessing, we work very closely with the Association of Plastic Recyclers and the Recycled Paperboard Technical Association and their expertise. Um, but then you have to think about end markets, of course, because if there's not value for the material, at the end of the day, you can't say that it's recyclable. But then we have to take all that information and ask ourselves, well, how does that all fit together? So a package is made up of different components. So even if individual components are recyclable on their own, what if you're combining them in ways where one component is rendering another component non-recyclable? Or how is the consumer going to experience this package? Because we are telling people what to do, and so we can't ask people to do surgery on their packaging in their kitchen and give them an existential crisis. So we have to have a common sense perspective, but then we also have to think about consistency of um, every label compared to um, the label that we've issued in the past and will issue in the future. And so below you can see this is the definition established by the Federal Trade Commission and they are concerned with avoiding consumer deception in environmental marketing claims. So this law is on the books to prevent um, companies from saying that things are recyclable that are not recyclable. And so our labeling system is designed in accordance with this guidance and we did work with FTC when we uh, designed the label initially. So I mentioned we do a custom recyclability assessment for packaging. We're doing this for about 150 products per day. Something else that we do, though, is we don't just give companies this label to put on their packaging. We also give them feedback how to improve the recyclability of their packaging. Because a lot of times brands are making decisions at the packaging design level where they're um, compromising the recyclability of something. And so we will specifically tell them on a practical level, switch to a different closure or consider a different material type um, for your package to be more recyclable. And so in the last year and a half or so, we've issued 50,000 specific recommendations to the companies in our program to make their packaging more recyclable. So we do want to help companies improve. It's an important part of our program. So a little bit about how How to Recycle helps contamination in the recycling stream. I mentioned our not yet recycled label, and here you can see it on a variety of different packaging types. It's really important um, for these companies that they're being transparent and telling the consumer not to recycle those items, and that helps keep it out of the MRF where it does not belong. And then I mentioned also our store drop-off labels so that bags and wraps are not finding their way wrapped around the equipment at MRFs and causing problems there. So here are some examples of the store drop-off label in the wild. This is from a bale audit of a store drop-off bale that we did. And you can see it's on a variety of packages like toilet paper wrap and e-commerce mailers and case wrap around drinks and that sort of a thing. Another way that How to Recycle helps with contamination is by 
um, distinguishing between lookalike packages. So in an ideal world, a package that looks the same is as recyclable as another package that looks the exact same. But unfortunately, packaging engineering is really complex and there are nuances in packaging design that are not immediately visible to people. And so here's an example of how the how to recycle label distinguishes between those lookalike packages. So here you have a stand-up pouch. They're becoming increasingly ubiquitous in the marketplace. The vast majority, 99%, I would guess, are not recyclable because they're made of multiple materials. Um, and so it's important to tell the consumer not to recycle most of them, but companies are innovating packaging to flexible packaging to be able to carry the store drop-off label. So the package on the right can be recycled through store drop-off. You may be wondering, well, does the label make a difference? We're confident that it is. We have a survey on our website where we ask people about their experience with the How to Recycle label, and 61% of them say that they're changing their behavior as a result. So they're either recycling more or they're not recycling things they um, aren't supposed to be. And then similarly, 82% say that they're learning about recycling from the label. And so this is really important that we have this information on packaging. 67% of people, if they don't see a recycling claim on the package, they assume that it's not recyclable. So sometimes we hear people say, well, everyone knows how to recycle a PET bottle. Well, this suggests that a lot of people will throw it away unless if there's a recycling claim on the package. So it's really important to us that we increase the number of companies in our program and we encourage them to use the label on as many items as possible. So now I want to switch more and talk about flexible packaging in a little bit more detail. So I mentioned that we're a part of Sustainable Packaging Coalition, which is a membership organization where companies from all across the packaging supply chain come together, so material manufacturers and packaging producers and then brands and retailers. Um, so we have a really good idea of what's happening in the packaging space and into the future. And there is a really big movement towards flexible packaging. Now, this isn't to say that all packaging in the future is going to be flexible or that it should be, but that's certainly where we're headed. So for example, check out this market share of packaging types. On the far left-hand side is flexible pl plastic, which is double greater market share than the next highest, which is PET bottles. So I believe this is globally, but uh, flexible packaging is a huge part of the market, and it's going to continue to increase. 83% of brands are currently using flexible packaging, but that's going to increase. Over the next five years, this poll by Flexible Packaging Association finds 31% of brands are intending to increase their use of flexibles. One of the reasons why this is not a surprise to us is because of corporate sustainability goals. So there are a lot of emerging corporate goals for packaging, um, two really main categories. One is to lower the carbon footprint of packaging, and another is to increase the recyclability of packaging. We have um, SPC, we have a what's called our goals database, where we have compiled the packaging goals of many, many different companies. This is just a few examples of companies who are in How to Recycle. They have goals in both areas, to lower their carbon, but also to increase the recyclability of their packaging. What's interesting is sometimes this creates attention for certain companies and certain product applications. The classic low carbon package, the iconic one, would be a flexible package. It uses a lot less material, less air to ship in um, transport. There are a lot of reasons why flexible packaging is lower carbon impact usually. Um, but then in a great classic example of a recyclable package is a steel can. It can be recycled infinitely, theoretically. And so um, sometimes the question is, well, how do you get both low carbon packaging that's also recyclable? Because we know the flexible packaging is not recyclable. And so what that means is store drop-off recyclable packaging for flexible packaging has become the icon for what can give you a low carbon footprint and is also recyclable. And since store drop-off is the only recyclability option at scale today, it means that more and more brands are going to be moving their packaging into store drop-off, and we're already seeing that happen. This is a, uh, a sub, this is an analysis of the different 
recyclability categories for all the products we've issued how to recycle labels for. And so you can see that half of it is widely recycled, which is great, it's good material. Um, almost a third is not recyclable. And then um, only about 8% is store drop off right now. But we think that that is going to increase because of these corporate goals to increase recyclability. I mentioned before we issue recommendations for design improvement. The number one recommendation in our whole system is for companies to change their flexible packaging to one that qualifies for store drop-off. We issued this over 7,000 times in the last year. So this non-recyclable piece of the pie is probably going to get smaller and a bigger and the store drop-off is going to get bigger. So you can use polyethylene film for a lot of different product categories currently. So I showed you the case wrap and the toilet paper products. There's a lot of things where um, from a performance perspective, you can use that polyethylene film today and you don't need additional barrier. You don't need the packaging to accomplish more um, than it does currently. But there are a lot of product categories where you need innovation in order to enable movement into polyethylene films. So these are some product areas um, where companies are really trying to push the limits of what they can do from a technology perspective with their packaging to um, get it into store drop-off. So coffee, tea, and sugar, cold chain packaging. So um, the meal kits that you get, keeping things cold, electronics protective packaging, candy, dry pet food, snacks. Um, there's other things in e-commerce, uh, things like air pillows where uh, you're going to see more and more movement towards store drop-off in these areas. But innovation is required at a, at a technical level, so they're putting different ingredients into the packaging to get it to protect the product better. So we're already seeing this happen um, in sugar and pet food. These are first in category for those featuring the store drop-off label. But as companies start putting all these different ingredients into the flexible packaging to get it to do more, the question is, what is going to continue to fit into the store drop-off stream as the complexity of polyethylene packaging increases? And so for How to Recycle, it was important to us that we didn't issue the store drop-off label to packages that are bringing the quality of that stream down. So as companies are adding these ingredients to make the package have better oxygen barrier, moisture barrier, we wanted to make sure that we weren't negatively impacting this material for recyclers. And so what we decided to do was conduct a study to better understand what's going on in the store drop-off stream today, and then how did certain packaging innovations fit into it. And we had a really strong demand from our leadership for us to do, uh, our membership to do this study because they are developing years ahead what their packaging is going to look like. So they want guidance in their research and development phase for what packaging is acceptable for store drop off. So it's been ongoing for a year, the study. The first stage, the first phase was we did bale sorts to study what is actually in the store drop off stream to better understand it. Then we studied the material properties on a very technical level of things like what is the moisture content and the melt flow rate and all sorts of um, uh, details there on the technical side. And then the next phase, looking at specific innovations that companies want to use and how those might fit into the stream in order to finally determine the best assessment process for store drop-off. So this is a preview of what we did in Boston and Houston, breaking up these bales. This is what they look like. We counted all the different types of packaging in there. We saw the store drop-off label on over 150 different products, and we uh, there's probably a thousand items per bale that have this, the store drop-off label on them. Something that we were really excited about, there was only one incorrect how to recycle label in the whole thing, and it was on a McDonald's paper bag, so we think someone thought it was a um, regular recycling bin. Um, some takeaways, consumers know what they're doing. This is the Amazon Prime pouch, and if you have received this at home, you may have seen the store drop-off label on it, and we have a special instruction to remove the paper label before recycling the pouch, because that paper label is detrimental to polyethylene film recyclers. And so we found several pouches in the bale where the consumer had taken the label out. 
But there was a huge opportunity for awareness of store drop-off because some people, they're going to all the effort to bring in their plastic shopping bags and maybe also they throw in their newspaper bags, but there's no packaging in it at all. So there's a big opportunity there to get that material out of the curbside or out of the landfill and get it into store drop-off. So we're excited with our members um, using the labeling system to help consumers understand the difference between different types of flexible packaging. So the, this is Target. They have been a longtime member and supporter of How to Recycle. They're using the Not Yet Recycled label on um, their packaging, and they're also using the store drop-off label and then collecting in their stores as well. There are a couple projects we have right now where we are engaging with municipalities on some of these issues. The city of Seattle is taking film packaging out of curbside currently, and so we're working with them to help strengthen the in-store collection. And then we're also working with the Recycling Partnership in Orange County, Florida. Um, and the partnership does messaging for um, carts at the curb and things like oops tags and direct mailers. And we're going to um, align the how to recycle messaging with their messaging on the ground. Thanks so much. Our next speaker is Brett Stevens. He's Vice President of Material Sales and Procurement for TerraCycle. TerraCycle uh, is serving, Brett has served in this position since 2014. He's been with the company in other capacity since 2009. He's a deep knowledge of TerraCycle's programs and different business units that allow them to function uh, in the recycling market. So, Brett. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> um, so, as was stated, uh, I represent TerraCycle, which is a global waste management company, what we do is we collect and recycle traditionally non-recyclable materials. So think about everything that you consume on a day-to-day -day basis that you do not have an option uh, to throw in your recycling bin. Things like chip bags, candy wrappers, all kinds of other items that you would otherwise throw away. We run private collection programs to collect those from consumers, schools, businesses, offices, you name it. Um, and we also scale that collection up to post-industrial waste from manufacturers and uh, other production facilities like that. So our uh, business model is based on these three big pillars here. The first one is to make everything recyclable. Um, now, when I say recyclable, I'm not talking about um, you know the traditional through your curbside bin type of recyclable. I'm talking about these private collection programs whereby brands fund the collection and recycling of these items. Um, so we work with lots of brands, lots of CPG companies around the world to do exactly that. Uh, and then once those brands have been onboarded, and they've scaled up their collection uh, with us and they've made their packaging recyclable. Our next goal is to try to get them to make their packaging or make their products from recycled content. So um, as Kelly was mentioning, there's lots of brands out there, lots of companies that have these stated goals to make their packaging recyclable or make their packaging from recycled content by a certain date. TerraCycle is not a traditional PCR supplier, so we're not, um, you know, one of the big traditional suppliers like a KW Plastics or someone like that. What we do is we sell these unique uh, waste streams, unique materials that come with a story behind them. The materials that we sell may be a little less capable than Virgin. They may be a little less. Uh, desirable than high-end recycled material, but they are very usable, and I'll show you, show you some examples of that. Um, and then lastly, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on this today, but we have a brand new business model, uh, a brand new business unit, I should say, within our company called Loop, and this is about convincing these brands to rethink the design of their packaging entirely, to shift from the, the make and dispose mentality to uh, a durable, reusable model. So um, that is just now launching uh, this month, actually, in a couple of pilot cities. So um, when we talk about recycling the non-recyclable, this Venn diagram, I think, um, illustrates the economics behind recycling really well. The items that you see on the left-hand side are traditional recycle traditional recyclables that are accepted uh, in most curbside bins, uh, regardless of where you live. 
The items on the right are traditionally non-recyclable, meaning consumers today don't really have an option for what to do with these items unless there's a private system to collect and recycle. Um, what you see at the top there is the economic equation that makes this all happen. The things on the left are recyclable not because they're the only technically recyclable things in the world, they are recyclable, they're accepted in your curbside bin because those items are profitable to recycle. The economics behind those make sense for waste management companies to take and recycle. So the example I always give is, let's take a PET bottle for example. If a PET bottle, just for argument's sake, costs five cents per pound to collect and process, and you can sell the resulting flake for 10 cents per pound, you would do that all day long. You would always spend five to make 10. What if that equation was flipped around on its head like it is for every other option that you see on the right? Most of these items cost more to collect and process than the resulting material is worth. So the economics don't make sense for the traditional waste management model. Our business uses brand sponsorships as a subsidy for this equation, meaning we are paid to collect and recycle lots of these different items um, by the brands, by CPG companies, by retailers, and that money that they're paying us acts as the subsidy to cover the processing cost so that I don't have to rely as heavily on um, being able to sell the resulting material at market rates. The reason we can't sell a lot of these things at market rates is because, as I said, they are more complex and not as capable after you recycle. We're talking about things like multi-layer films and, and everything that you see on the right. So um, the TerraCycle process, when a brand signs on with us or a retailer signs on to collect and process their waste, is all about logistics, meaning how are we physically going to collect it and get it into our possession um, as, as efficiently as possible. And then once we collect that material, how do we solve for it? So that's where TerraCycle uses a wide network of subcontractors to convert material from format A to format B so that it's usable. Very important to state that our company is not an asset-based recycler. So we do not own and operate our own plants. We rely heavily on partners who do have those plants, who do have the equipment necessary to sort, clean, pelletize, compound, all that type of work. Um, and we use hundreds of these companies around the world today, um, either on a tolling basis, meaning I'll provide our material to them, I'll ask them to do a service for me and give the material back, pay them a per pound rate to do that, uh, or we'll use those companies um, as outlets for material if they have a need for that feedstock for their own supply chain. And then once we do all that, TerraCycle also acts as like a marketing agency on the back end, a PR agency, a marketing agency. We employ a, a team of publicists and uh, a, a very deep marketing staff to promote the fact that these brands are making their packaging recyclable or that they're using recycled content from us in their packaging. Um, and that provides some of the ROI that these brands are looking for to help justify some of the cost uh, that comes with our programs. So I talked a bit about um, logistics. How do we physically collect and get material into our possession? This is a sampling here of a number of different logistics models that we use uh, for different customer bases that we have. For instance, um, in the top left corner, there's a box that uh, a lot of optometry offices around the country now have to recycle contact lenses. So this is a box that is a cardboard box, not very big, we're talking about three feet tall. Comes with a prepaid UPS shipping label on the side of it. It is designed to collect one very specific stream, the contact lens waste. That material gets shipped back to TerraCycle where it is um, aggregated with other other um, contact lens waste. And then once we have collected to scale, usually tr truckload quantities, we will um, move forward with the processing of that material with, with one of our select partners. So this is an example of how we have multiple logistics models depending on what the need is. The next one on the right there is uh, for a program that we operated with Target to collect and recycle um, car seats. 
So that is more of a freight-based collection model where uh, there's Gaylord boxes sitting on a pallet in Target stores. Consumers come in and drop their car seats off. Store associate will wheel that pallet back to the back of house once it's full, replace it with an empty one. And then Target uses their uh, backhauling or reverse logistics network to bring car seats from 1,700 stores to 25 distribution centers. So that is the way that they accumulate or aggregate material at scale so that we can then pick up, transport, and process truckload quantities. The other examples here um, are just other, other options that uh, consumers have. So whether you want to send material to us by small parcel, there are options for that. If you want to do an LTL program to send us a couple of pallets, we have options for that. And then lastly, of course, full truckload quantities where we typically go direct to recycling. How we process waste, um, as I just mentioned, when we receive packages at any one of our warehouses, what we do is we check in those packages and then store it or stage it with like materials, things that are made of the same material composition, so that we can um, accumulate truckload quantities of whatever that waste stream is, and then move forward with the processing. Um, as I mentioned, we work with a, a wide network of strategic partners that have the processing capabilities that we need, whether it's uh, mechanical sorting, sink float, you know, shredding, washing, drying, whatever it may be. Um, we hire these companies to do the work on our behalf with the instructions that we give them. So uh, if I'm looking for uh, a company to use optical sortation to break a commingled stream out into three or four different buckets of material, that would be a, an option for a company that we would use. And then lastly, it's up to us, once we collect and process these items, to find suitable end markets for them. So as I mentioned, a lot of the things that we collect are complicated, multi-layer, multi-component products. And sometimes when we process the material, it's not a very high grade material because it may be, um, you know, like a, for instance, take like a juice pouch uh, that you would see like Capri Sun in. That's a multi-layer material that has polyethylene, PET, and aluminum in it. Very difficult to physically separate those layers using mechanical processing. So we will process that material all together into one commingled pellet. So this is a low end pellet in this case, but it is it has suitable properties to go into uh, lots of different applications, whether it's uh, composite decking, lumber, outdoor furniture, playgrounds, that kind of thing. Now I'm going to show you a couple of um, examples for how we move material through the supply chain from the raw material through several stages of processing and into some of the end products that we, uh, that we move material into. So this one is a case study on those multi-layer flexible pouches that I just mentioned. Um, as you can see there on the left, you know, we collect this material in multiple formats from production facilities, from consumers. This is multiple formats of the same waste stream. So top left, what you're seeing is a bell of post-consumer pouches. Um, the second one over, these are what's called the, the stars and dots that are from the production waste where they're punching holes in the tops of these pouches for straws. Uh, and then there's also trim waste uh, from the production. There is loose, um, unfilled pouches from the production line that may be off spec for one reason or another. And what we do with this material is we densify it into a crumb-like material, which you see there on the bottom left. That material is that commingled mixture that I talked about. It's not very pretty to look at. Once we turn that material into densified format, we have to create a little bit more of a uniform uh, material for production. So we'll go into that pellet there. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but there are visible aluminum flecks in those pellets. So again, not very pretty to look at, but it is a functional product and it does work. Uh, it does have the mechanical properties needed to make certain products. And so the example here is that that material goes into the core of these composite uh, lumber pieces here. So there are lots of companies. If you walk up and down the, the aisles at a Home Depot or a Lowe's, lots of companies that sell composite decking. Some of them use um, a, a capped product, meaning they put lower end material into the core and then they'll cap it with a, a nicer recycled HDP on the outside for texture and color and whatever else they need. Um, but that's one example of, of how a unique material can go into a functional end product. 
Another example here is um, flexible multi-layer um, packaging from the snack bag industry. So whether this is a chip bag company or a uh, candy company, these are also multi-layer packages. Dominant polymer here is polypropylene with a small, a small amount of polyethylene. What we do is we take this production scrap that is obsolete for one reason or another. Maybe it's misprinted, maybe uh, it's just an overrun, maybe it's a seasonal product that the SKU is no longer being sold. So we'll take that product and we turn that into pellets as well. And as you can see, those pellets there on the bottom left, they're like a army green, grayish color. Reason for that is because of all the ink on the packaging. I like to use the analogy of, you know, when you're a kid and you have watercolor paints, if you muddle all of those colors together, you end up with this kind of uh, army, army green type of color. That pellet is a polypropylene copolymer, which can be used to make a number of different uh, molded products. Some examples I've shown, I'm showing here are the interior plastic liner for a cooler. This is a private label cooler that is sold at Walmart stores around the country. Um, and they, they take these pellets and inject, dye them black and injection mold them into that um, cooler liner. Another example is with our partners at Expo where uh, we've put this material into what they call an Expo ledge. This is a plastic, uh, an injection molded plastic product that can clip onto the bottom of a whiteboard. Uh, so many whiteboards that you may have on a wall don't have that ledge on the bottom. This, this is a clip on uh, tool for that. And then lastly, a really big output for this type of material is the uh, plastic pallet industry. So. Uh, we work with a number of companies who make recycled plastic pallets out of polypropylene, and this is a perfectly suitable material to go into that application. Last example here I'm going to show is the um, a case study on our beach and ocean plastic supply chain. So we are um, actively collecting through a network of volunteers and, uh, and, uh, and other types of organizations around the world, actively collecting legitimate marine plastic coming from beaches, oceans, rivers, and lakes. And this material is very degraded. It's been sitting out in the sun, so there's UV degradation. It's been sitting in salt water. The material is, you know, it's, it's mucked up, it's dirty. Um, so we, when we collect this material, we go through the process of sorting it into the right categories. I'm gonna show you the PET example. Um, but what we do is we collect any rigid plastic. We then mechanically sort it. Uh, and we end up with isolated streams of PET, HDPE, and so on. What I'm showing you here is the PET. So top left, you can see how dirty those bottles are. That is um, a little bit grimier than you would see in a curbside bale. What we do with this material is um, we, we shred it, we wash it, we dry it, and we compound this material with 50% curbside recycled PET. The reason we make a blend is because of that degradation factor that I just mentioned. So we make a 100% recycled PET pellet. Half of that material is marine waste. The other half is uh, curbside waste. And then what we do with that material is we pelletize it. It goes through all of the normal food grade PET steps, uh, you know, solid stating, raising the IV, all of that. Uh, and then we sell that product to consumer product companies to make their new packaging. Some examples here, this is Fairy Dish Soap Bottle. It's the, um, the European version of like Dawn Dish Soap. And uh, we also sell this material to Unilever. They make a Ren skincare bottle from this. And there's a number of other companies in multiple industries that are also trialing this material now. Um, but the story here is that these brands can not only make their packaging from recycled content, but they can tell a very powerful story by using these unique materials. Curbside recycled content in packaging is great, but there's only a finite supply of that material. And as brands are making these proclamations to use um, more and more recycled content, there's only so much of it out there, so much of the high-end material that these brands need. And so part of my role is to try to convince these brands to be a bit more open-minded and as long as the material is mechanically workable, whether it can make a functional product, um, they should give it a try. And uh, like I said, we, we have that marketing agency function. So after we sell this material, we don't, you know, that's not the end. We don't just send an invoice and thank you for your business. We then help these brands promote what they've just done. We will help them sell in this product 
to their key retail accounts. We will uh, pitch this story to all of our um, all the journalists that we uh, that we work with regularly, and the idea here is we're generating buzz on behalf of these brands, not only for doing the right thing by reusing recycled packaging, um, but to to tell the story about uh, the innovation. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I think that's it. Thank you all for coming, and I'm sure you could come talk to some questions after. Thank you.